This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Tonight we're going to start with vaccines, and when I picked this topic, uh, I had I knew it would be uh, controversial and interesting, uh, but had no idea that it would be quite as controversial and quite as interesting as it's become in the last uh, six weeks or so. Uh, so it's a very exciting topic, and I think you'll find it both very practical. Uh, there are some new vaccines, and there certainly are new recommendations for vaccines in adults. Um, I suspect before you leave here tonight, um, almost all of you will uh, decide that you want at least one new vaccine. And I, <laughs> and I have a feeling which one or two it might be. Uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Uh, Kathy Julian. Uh, Kathy is uh, director of the Primary Care Internal Medicine Residency Program at UCSF. Uh, she's also a professor of medicine. Uh, she's an outstanding teacher, and I think uh, you'll agree. She's a member of our Academy of Medical Educators. Uh, and really a devoted mentor of our medical students and particularly our primary care residents. So please join me in welcoming Kathy Julian. Okay, so let me just make sure. Can folks hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I got the thumbs up. I can't even see the person in the back, but I'm assuming it's where, where I go. Okay, so we're gonna do a whirlwind tour of vaccines for adults. And first, I'll just say that I have no conflicts of interest. So I'm not paid by any drug companies to come and uh, peddle their, their drugs to you. Because I will talk about a lot of different types of vaccines, and I'll use a lot of the trade names. So just so you know, I'm, I'm not getting paid. Um, there are a lot of vaccines that are available in the United States for children and adults. And I've listed them here. You can see it's a really long list. We'll focus mostly on the ones for adults, although I will touch on some of them that we do give to teenagers. And of course, I have to talk about measles tonight. So, um, so of course, that also affects children as well. But the ones that I'm gonna specifically talk about are the ones that are highlighted in yellow. And of course, I'm happy to uh, answer other questions about some of the other vaccines at the end of the talk today. But these are the ones that I'll focus on in particular. And the other thing that I'll just direct your attention to is we have other vaccines that are available in the U.S., but they're really for very specific populations. So if you're a microbiologist working at the CDC, uh, you know, doing studies on smallpox, well, gosh, you know, you want to think that you'll be protected against smallpox or anthrax. And so I won't talk about those, and those aren't available for the general population, but just something to know is, is out there. I will direct you, though, to the CDC website. Um, it has a lot of resources, both for physicians and for the general public. They have handouts written for the general public about all of the vaccines that are available. They talk about the schedule for vaccines. They have great smartphone apps that you can download and put on your phones, for those of you that are into that. Uh, they have a lot of just general information and updates on a lot of these diseases that I'll talk about tonight. So certainly there's a lot of resources there. They have great videos and, and all sorts of things. So you can definitely read more there. Before I start talking about each of the vaccines, I just uh, want to talk a little bit about the approval process for vaccines because when I talk about some of them today, you'll hear me talk about some vaccines that are approved by the federal, the I should say Food and Drug Administration, so the Federal Drug Administration, versus vaccines that are actually recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. And sometimes there is a difference. 
So once a vaccine has gone through some of the studies and it's decided that it's safe, it's approved by the Food and Drug Administration, by the FDA. But just because it's approved doesn't necessarily mean that it's recommended yet. And so then what happens is there's actually a group of providers that come together. They're researchers, they're doctors, other healthcare providers, and they sit on this board called the ACIP, which is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And that's a kind of a subset of the Centers for Disease Control. And so they meet periodically through the year and look at all the evidence about a vaccine and then will make a recommendation as to whether they recommend the vaccine should be given and what at, at what age for people. And once they make that recommendation, then the Centers for Disease Control will say, okay, now we recommend this vaccine for everybody over the age of 65, for example. So there are a few vaccines that I'll talk about today that have just been approved by the FDA within the last few weeks, but haven't yet been recommended by the ACIP. So I just wanted to make that a little bit clear. This is a really hard slide to see, but basically every year the Centers for Disease Control puts together their recommended vaccines that they think adults should have and they put it in this graph format, although you can download it on your smartphone from the Centers for Disease Control and we'll go through most of these vaccines. But the point is actually that these were just updated just last week and so they have made some new recommendations and we'll talk about those specifically. And like I said, it's hard to see, but I'll go through them as part of my talk today. And I think I'll touch on um, actually all of these that are listed here. But certainly this is on the CDC website as well. Okay, so I thought I would start off. We have to talk about this first. First of all, where is this? Right, it's the happiest place on earth, right? That's what I say when I take my children there. This is the happiest place on earth. Um, and unfortunately has been the site for a big measles outbreak and it sounds like all of you have, have seen that in the news. So I thought we would start talking about this first. So we have seen a resurgence of measles here in the United States and of course the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, they track this. Um, in terms of just looking at the month of January alone, we have seen 102 cases, and there are still more even in February. And you can go on the CDC website and they're just ticking down the cases. You can see it updated every day. Um, so they've seen 102 cases as of January, um, affecting 14 states. There are even more states with outbreaks today. California, of course, um, has had the most cases thus far out of this outbreak. So this is just one outbreak uh, right now, representing um, so far 92% of all of the cases seen this year. What's interesting is you'll, you'll see this graph they've started just in 2001, looking at the number of measles cases. You know, in 2001, we had a little bit over 100 measles cases here in the U.S. And then you'll see, this is last year, it's 2014, boom, big increase, over 600 cases. And then this case alone, 102 cases here, you know, we've already hit one-sixth of the number of cases we had last year, and that's just in one month. So I think we are off to a big start for measles, and we're starting to, to see more. So why is this? Why are we seeing a resurgence of measles? Uh, a few things. One is that when they look at the first initial measles cases coming out of Disneyland, of the first 52 initial cases that were reported to the CDC, what they found was that 28 of these, over 55 percent, were in people who had not been vaccinated for measles. And another 17, 31 percent, couldn't say whether they had been vaccinated or not. It wasn't clear. What's a little surprising is there were six cases in people who were vaccinated. Um, two of those six cases, people had only had one vaccination, and we'll talk about how effective the measles vaccination is in a minute. But four people had been vaccinated and had had two doses, which is a little bit unusual. What we do know is that measles is extremely contagious. So if you put someone in a room with someone else who has measles, there's a 90% chance that that person's gonna get measles, so it's extremely contagious. It is spread by droplets, and what that means is it's spread if people are coughing or sneezing, they release little droplets into the air that then someone else breathes in, and that causes measles. 
And we also know that not only is it spread by droplets, but those droplets can land on surfaces and can live for several hours. So of course, imagine an amusement park where people are going in and off of rides, and you can just see how easily that has spread. We had considered that measles was what we called eliminated in the United States. And when we, when we talk about what does that mean, it basically means that there's no endemic measles circulating in the United States um, within a 12-month period. So the measles that we're seeing, we think, is actually coming from elsewhere and then is being spread here because you know, we do not have 100% vaccination status for people that are here. So in 2014, we saw about 23 different outbreaks here in the US. We already said there were over 600 cases. And most of those were in people who had not been vaccinated. And what we find is that it tends to be folks who travel elsewhere where there is endemic measles. And particularly, the countries that we see it most are countries in Europe, <coughs> India, the Philippines has had um, several big measles outbreaks. So people go and travel. Maybe they are not vaccinated, and then they bring measles back into the United States, where then it spreads if people are not vaccinated. Let's talk just a little bit about measles. And what's, you know, what we're finding is that we're having to do a lot of education among healthcare providers because most healthcare providers have never seen measles. I myself have only seen it once, and that was when I was a medical student. So uh, measles is spread by a virus. The type of virus that it is is it's called a morbillivirus. Um, and it basically only has one type. So there's only one type of measles. So once you're immune to that one type of measles, you can't get it again. Um, and basically, this is a great picture. This is from the CDC website of a child with measles. And it really illustrates it well because it's really an acute viral illness. Unlike the cold, the common cold, where maybe it only takes a couple days to come down with it, measles has a pretty long incubation period. So usually people are exposed to measles and they don't start getting symptoms for up to one to three weeks. So people then you know, present several weeks later with symptoms. And the symptoms that people get are, you can tell, runny nose, right? Watery eyes, and the eyes themselves are very red, um, and cough. So, Basically, we like to call it the three C's, the coryza, runny nose, cough, and conjunctivitis, meaning that red, runny, itchy eyes. So this is classic for measles. What we find is that when people get those, you know, that cough, that runny nose, well, gosh, that can look like a lot of other viral illnesses. Quite honestly, my daughter is home tonight and, you know, has well, the flu by all practical purposes and looks just like that. Um, but what we know is that when people get measles, if you open their mouth, you can actually see these little spots in the back of the mouth, and they're pathognomonic for measles. So if you see those spots in the mouth, that is measles, hands down. And they're spots called coplic spots. And basically what they look like is a little grain of white sand or almost like a little piece of rice on top of a background of red. Um, and you can see it in the, in the cheeks of the mouth right back behind where the, where the back molars are. And so those spots come out about the same time that people get uh, the, that fever and runny nose. And the reason we want to train healthcare providers to look and identify that is because people get those symptoms well before they get the rash of measles. And remember I said measles is really contagious, so if we can, you know, identify measles early before people go out and spread it all over, um, that's obviously much better to do. So we need to train providers to kind of look and think about measles when they see a viral illness. Once that has happened, you know, these little spots in the back of the mouth, runny nose, cough, several days after that, about 14 days after exposure, people get the classic rash of measles. And the rash is kind of a red rash here. If you were to close your eyes, you could feel it lightly over, you know, while touching with your hands. Generally starts in the face and cheeks and then actually spreads downward over um, the rest of the body. And people be, are infectious with measles four days before this rash occurs and up to four days after the rash which is one of the reasons why we want to train healthcare providers to really identify measles early so we can really isolate people. Why do we worry about measles in the first place? Well, measles can cause some complications, including ear infections and pneumonia. 
but about one out of 1,000 people who get measles can get acute encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, which obviously can be deadly. And one out of 1,000 children infected with measles will die, either from the neurologic complications or the respiratory complications. They get a bad pneumonia and die. There's a really rare um, side effect with measles. Seven to 10 years after people are infected, they can get something called um, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is basically inflammation of, the, of a diffuse area of the brain. And it basically is like a degenerative uh, disease. So people get um, behavioral and intellectual deterioration over time with seizures. So measles, you know, absolutely can have complications and can be deadly. How do we prevent it? Well, we give a vaccine. And there's the vaccine for measles is what we call an MMR vaccine. So it's a vaccine that covers measles, but it also covers mumps and rubella, also known as German measles. So we don't have just a measles vaccine. The measles vaccine really uh, covers all three of these. We give it twice. And the reason we give it twice is that we know if we give one dose of measles vaccine or the MMR vaccine, it's 93% effective. But we like to give two doses because occasionally there's vaccine failure. And if we give two doses, it's about 97% effective. Generally, it's offered to children age 12 to 15 months. So that's the age that uh, most kids will get their first dose of measles vaccine. And then it's redosed again, usually at that kindergarten visit right around age five. And it's a live vaccine. And we'll talk about live vaccines. There's a few others that we'll talk about. So what does that mean when I say it's a live vaccine? What I mean is that they take that virus and um, take a particle of it to create that vaccine, but that particle is not fully killed. Um, and so even though we're giving it to a young person, if you have a normal immune system, giving that vaccine will not cause measles. But if we were to give that vaccine to somebody that had no immune system, let's say they had just had a bone marrow transplant and you know had had a lot of chemotherapy and didn't have a good immune system, they could actually get measles from that vaccine. So that's what we mean when we talk about a live vaccine versus a vaccine that's been killed for all practical purposes. If we're talking about a vaccine that is not a live vaccine, that means it cannot cause the disease that we are vaccinating for. So that's something to know about the measles vaccine is that it is a live vaccine. And so who should get the measles vaccine? I will tell you that I have gotten, every day I get calls from patients asking about whether they should be vaccinated for measles given the outbreak. So adults who were born before 1957 are considered immune to measles. And that is because before 1957, there was so much measles circulating, and we already know how contagious it is, that folks who were born before 1957 had been exposed and are considered immune and don't need to be vaccinated. But if you were born in the year of 1957 or later, then you want to make sure that you are immune in some way, either that you're tested to see if you're immune, and you can do that by a simple blood test, or you want to make sure that you've been vaccinated with at least two doses of this MMR vaccine. So we already talked about children and the recommendations for vaccinating young people. It's recommended that if you have uh, young adults who, for example, are going to high school or college, um, if they are not immune, so meaning they do a blood test and it's shown that they're not immune, that they get at least two doses of this vaccine at least 28 days apart. Adults who were born either during 1957 or after who are not immune should be given at least one dose of the MMR vaccine. And then we already talked about that a lot of the measles we're seeing is really from people who are traveling, maybe who aren't immune and go travel somewhere and then bring measles back to the United States. So anyone who's, who's going to do international travel should make sure that they are immune. Um, and once again, that goes to either getting two doses of the vaccine. We talked about children and how the first dose of the measles vaccine is usually when children are very young, so when they're about a year old to you know, 15 months. But if you are going to take a child internationally and that child is not yet a year, it is recommended that as long as that infant is at least six months old, that they be dosed with an MMR vaccine. And then, then that child needs to be redosed again at 12 months 
and then they get a third dose, which is a little bit unusual, but they get a third dose at, at that kindergarten visit. So we're going to change gears a little bit as we're talking about diseases that are circulating right now in the winter time, and we're going to talk about flu. Um, and when I talk about flu, I'm specifically talking about influenza. So there are certainly a lot of viruses that can make you feel like you have the flu and you know, give you a runny nose and a cough and give you the fever. But what we're going to talk specifically is influenza, which is a virus that causes the flu. So what symptoms do people classically get when they have influenza? They get fever, they have chills, people feel terrible, they're really fatigued, they usually get a terrible headache, sore throat, and cough. And just like the measles, influenza is also spread through droplets. So people who sneeze and it's in the air, uh, and then you, know, you breathe that in and all of a sudden you have influenza. And the reason we worry about influenza is people can get complications from the flu, including sinus infections, pneumonia, or worsening of a chronic medical condition. So for example, somebody who has really bad asthma might then get a, an exacerbation of their asthma when they get the flu. So there's really two main types of flu, although there are three types of influenza viruses, A, B, and C. Type C mostly infects animals and doesn't really affect people. So you'll hear us talk about influenza A and influenza B um, with these two big types. And each year, there's usually a type A that kind of circulates and a type B. So you know, there's certainly more than one type of influenza that circulates every given fall. And influenza, if you were to look at it under a microscope, it has all of its um, uh, viral particles in the center of the cell. But on the surface of the cell, there are these proteins. You can kind of see them here, for example, these little yellow triangles. And these surface proteins are what make each virus, each influenza virus, different from another. Um, and so you'll hear people talk, I mean, a few years ago we were talking about H1N1 and you know, H2N2. These are all the different kinds of influenza that may circulate. So these proteins that are on the surface of this virus, there's really two main types of proteins. And depending on the components of those proteins and what they look like, that then tells us what type of influenza it is. And so every year these proteins can kind of change a little bit. And there's two different ways that these proteins can change. Um, they can do what's called drifting. And what that means is the proteins can maybe have little tiny mutations in them that change just slightly. So that let's say you got a flu shot last year and you know, you're immune to maybe that kind of flu. But then those proteins mutated a little bit and they will mutate and change enough until all of a sudden that influenza that's circulating this year looks a little bit different than last year and all of a sudden you're not immune to it anymore. And so that's what we call drift and that's how we get these um, a little outbreaks of influenza. And that's why every year the flu shot usually is a little bit different because they're trying to anticipate what is this flu virus going to look like this year? How is it going to mutate? How is it going to change? How do we need to redevelop this influenza vaccine? But occasionally, these, um, these proteins that are on the surface of this virus can actually change drastically, where they really resort themselves. And when they really resort themselves, then they ca cause a shift, and they really make a whole different kind of flu virus, one that we really haven't seen at all. And that's when we get these big pandemic outbreaks of, of flu. So I think the point here is that we're, I know there's been a lot in the press about the flu virus this year not being a very good match for the type of flu that happens to circulate. And that's really because the scientists who make it are trying to anticipate how is this virus going to change and how do we need to change the vaccine that we're making. So in 2015, why get the flu vaccine? You've probably heard through the news it's not a good match for the type of flu viruses that are circulating. I will say this, that the CDC is still recommending that people get the flu vaccine even though it's not a perfect match. And here's the reason why is because last year we know that the vaccine prevented about 7 million illnesses. It also prevented about 90,000 hospitalizations. And that was, it did all of that despite the fact that less than 50% of people over the age of six months got vaccinated. So if we can really just increase our vaccination rate, even if 
The flu, as they're saying this year, they think the flu vaccine will prevent the flu maybe 25% of the time, so not a great match. We think it's a good match if it prevents the flu about 50% of the time. So it's not a great match. But on the other hand, you can see from a population level, gosh, if we can prevent 7 million illnesses, wow, if we can increase the rate of vaccination even by a little bit, we really can prevent a lot, even if that vaccine isn't a perfect match this year. So for recommendations, who should be vaccinated for the flu? The recommendations are that anybody older than six months should be vaccinated. And I put, unless there's a contraindication, which we'll talk about, but in general, everyone should be vaccinated for the flu. And I'll tell you, my kids complain about it every year when I make them get vaccinated. Um, so this year, what does that vaccine look like? Remember how we talked about these uh, two different types of influenza viruses that circulate, the A type and the B type. Those are the two large types. But then there's all those surface proteins that make even different subtypes circulate. So when we talk about the flu vaccine, there's really two different types of flu vaccine. There's what we call a trivalent vaccine. And that vaccine basically includes a vaccine for two of the A types and one of the B type or it's a quadrivalent vaccine, meaning it protects you against two of the A strains and two of the B strains. And so you can see this year for the trivalent vaccine, you know, then it, it gives you this H1N1-like, et cetera, but it basically tells you what's the exact strain that it's protecting you from this year. And you can see that it's this one in particular, this type that just by happenstance just happens to not be a good match. There just happens to be a different A type that is circulating than what was put in that vaccine. We'll talk about which vaccine might be the best flu vaccine to get in a minute. Um, I'll tell you though that usually we'll say the best flu vaccine to get is the one that's available to you right in front of you that you can get. But if you truly had a choice, you'd probably want to choose a quadrivalent vaccine, meaning one that's going to cover you against more circulating flu strains. OK, so there is a lot of uh, new types of influenza vaccines that are out there. And any of you who've ever driven past a Walgreens, you can see sometimes all the different signs that they have, the high dose flu vaccine and the low dose flu vaccine. And so, um, so a lot of different types to choose from. But basically, the types boil down like this. There's what we call an inactivated influenza vaccine. And when I say it's inactivated, it means it is not a live vaccine. It cannot cause the flu. Um, and it's given as a shot, right? So flu shot, it is, if you're getting a flu shot in your arm, that is an inactivated vaccine. And I do have patients ask me a lot, you know, I, I got that vaccine last year and I got the flu. <laughs> and I'll say the vaccine cannot cause the flu, but probably maybe it wasn't the best match and you were exposed to a, a different flu virus since, of course, it can't protect you against all of the strains. But the inactivated vaccine is given by an injection into your arm. Um, and it comes in a couple different formulations. It comes in a trivalent form, protecting you against two of the A strains and one of the B strains, or a quadrivalent form. Um, and depending on where you go, they may you know, have the, either the trivalent or the quadrivalent. There's also a new flu vaccine out this year, which I'll talk about in a minute, and we'll talk about the advantages for this, but it's a recombinant vaccine, and it basically covers the exact same types of flu as the shot. Um, it's a trivalent vaccine. And then there is a live flu vaccine. It's called a live attenuated vaccine. And what that means is if you have a normal immune system, it will not cause the flu. But if you were to give this vaccine to somebody who didn't have a good immune system, maybe they were immunocompromised for some, in some way, then it could cause the flu, which is why we wouldn't want to give this vaccine to someone who is immunocompromised. But the live vaccine is actually, um, this year is a quadrivalent formulation, protects against two of the A strains and two of the B strains. And the live vaccine is given as a nasal spray. So I already answered this, does the flu shot cause the flu? No, it does not, as long as you have a good immune system. So this year for the seasonal flu vaccine, the shot, the inactivated influenza vaccine is approved for anybody over the age of six months. 
We already said it's given as an injection, can make your arm a little bit sore after you get it. Versus the live vaccine um, covers the same strains as the shot, but it's given as an intranasal nasal spray. Um, my, my kids tell me that it tastes terrible, but uh, they like getting it better than getting the shot. The advantage of the live vaccine as a nasal spray is it's what we call cold adapted and temperature sensitive. And what that means is they spray that virus, that, inactiv that um, inactivated virus up your nose, and that virus replicates in the nose where it's cooler, but doesn't replicate in the rest of your body. And so the advantage of that is, you know when you get the flu shot, how sometimes people will say, gosh, I feel a little achy the next day. I feel like I'm almost coming down with the flu. Well, the nasal spray doesn't do that because it doesn't replicate in your body at 37 degrees. So, um, so when people get the nasal spray, they don't tend to have that ache and that fatigue after getting that nasal spray. They tend to feel a little bit better. It does cause a runny nose and can cause nasal congestion and a little bit of headache. And it's not for people who have asthma because it can cause wheezing. So it's not recommended for anybody who has asthma. And it's approved for people who are healthy, who have a good immune system, ages 2 to 49. So it is not recommended for older adults. And so here's the reason why, is um, if we were to compare this live vaccine versus this inactivated vaccine head to head, we know that in children, the live vaccine actually tends to work a little bit better for whatever reason. We think that for a child's immune system, that live vaccine just tends to protect them a little bit better. So for kids, if you have a choice, actually, you know, I would choose the live vaccine, which is probably better anyway, because what child wants to get a shot? Um, so it is recommended for children ages two to eight if you were to have a choice. But in adults, there's good evidence that the shot actually works a little bit better than the live vaccine. So I tell adults, if you have a choice, better to get the shot than, um, than the nasal spray. Who should not get that live vaccine, that nasal spray? Well, remember we said that it is only approved for ages 2 to 49. So if you're over 49, you're out of luck. you got to get the shot. We already said that it can cause wheezing, so it's not for people who have asthma. And it's a live vaccine, so we don't want to give it to anybody who is immunosuppressed or maybe somebody who's caring for someone who's immunosuppressed. So for example, our nursing staff, our physicians here, we are not allowed to get the live vaccine because we might care for somebody who has had a bone marrow transplant or doesn't have a good immune system and they don't want us spreading that live vaccine, that live virus to them. Uh, it, because it's a live vaccine, we, we try not to use any live vaccines in women who are pregnant. So if women are pregnant, they are to get the shot instead of the live vaccine. Okay, so some of you may have seen on the Walgreens signs, they say we have the high dose flu vaccine. So in 2009, the FDA licensed a high dose flu vaccine called Fluzone. It's specifically for older adults, adults who are 65 and older. And basically, it contains about four times the amount of the protein that's in the normal flu vaccine. So it is, it is a higher dose flu vaccine. Um, and what they found when they look at how well does it work, uh, they took 31,000 people and they divided them in half and in a random way and gave half of them the high dose flu vaccine and the half of them the regular flu vaccine. And then they followed them and looked at how many got the flu. And what they found was that those who got the high dose flu, 1.4% of them got influenza in that season. Versus folks who got the regular flu vaccine, 1.9% got influenza. So it really did work, even though the, you know, you're thinking 1.9 to 1.4, well, gosh, that's, you know, it doesn't seem like a big difference. But when you're talking about 31,000 people, you know, that's actually a pretty, pretty big difference. And so the way they boil that down is probably works almost 25% better than the regular flu vaccine. Um, what, I, what I do know is that people who get this high dose vaccine tend to complain a little bit more that the site itself gets a little more red, a little more tender. So that is one side effect of it. But if you truly had a choice and you're over the age of 65, you know, the high dose flu vaccine looks like it might be a little bit more effective. But once again, we said, what's the best flu vaccine to get? 
the one that's in front of you that you can get right then and there. So, um, so I wouldn't hold out just to get the high dose. On the opposite end of the spectrum, um, we also have what I might call the low dose flu vaccine, and it's an intradermal vaccine. Um, and this vaccine was developed several years ago when we had that big flu vaccine shortage. And so, it, in, you know, in contrast to the high dose flu vaccine that's about four times stronger, this one is, I would say, maybe about not quite half the dose of a regular flu vaccine. So it really was developed with the hope that we could conserve our vaccine supply if we were to ever have a shortage. Um, this is approved uh, not for older adults, but ages 18 to 64 years. And ironically, we also see more local reactions when it's given. So a little more redness, a little more tenderness at the site, which you'd think, why would that occur when it's a low dose? But it's really because the needle itself is very, very small. So it tends to hurt a little bit less when it first goes in. But it goes in just right under the skin instead of being deposited deeper in the muscle like the regular flu vaccine. So for whatever reason, when that medicine is just deposited right under the skin, it seems to cause a little bit more of a reaction seems to work just as well as the other um, flu vaccines. So if you're someone who happens to be really, really afraid of needles, uh, this needle is absolutely smaller and the dose that goes into your body is smaller, so this certainly could be an option. The other thing I'll just say is I've had a lot of patients who are allergic to eggs and say, gosh, I can't get the flu vaccine because the flu vaccine is made in eggs. Um, and it is true, both the inactivated vaccine and the live um, vaccine are both made, they take embryonated, uh, embryonated eggs and use it to kind of grow this uh, virus. Uh, so for that reason, they are, and, and I've also had other people who didn't want to get it for you know, other reasons because either they're really strict vegans, et cetera. Um, so that's, that is something to know about, I know, um, about the vaccine. But this year, uh, we have a new vaccine called a recombinant influenza vaccine. And basically, they, they're making that vaccine in a different way, and they're making it without eggs. So it is truly an egg-free vaccine. So this year, when I have patients who say, oh, I can't get the flu vaccine, I'm allergic to eggs, I say, guess what? Yes, you can, because we have one. Um, and, uh, and actually, not only do we have this one that is truly egg-free, but there's another type of flu vaccine that's also made called Flusilvax that is actually made in the kidney cells of dogs. Uh, it is initially made with a little bit of egg, so it's not fully egg-free, but it, we might call it egg light, I guess, is how I might <laughs> categorize it. So the recommendations are if someone has a mild egg allergy, and we classify a mild egg allergy as someone who gets hives from eggs. I know that may seem, gosh, that seems like a pretty strong egg allergy, but we consider that to be a mild egg allergy, someone who gets hives. They can either get this egg-free vaccine or they can even get the regular flu vaccine because even though that regular flu vaccine is made in eggs, it is such a small amount that the CDC feels the chance that someone's truly going to have a reaction is very, very small. So they said people can either get this egg-free vaccine or the regular flu vaccine as long as they're monitored when the regular flu vaccine is given. But if someone has truly a severe egg allergy, and that means if they were exposed to eggs, they actually get a reaction even in their internal organs, meaning they get vomiting and diarrhea and just very rapidly ill. Those people are considered to have a severe egg allergy and really should get this egg-free vaccine. So you don't need to remember all the names, of course, but just to know, gosh, if I have somebody who's really allergic to eggs, there is an egg-free flu vaccine that is available. I already answered this question, what type of influenza vaccine is the best? What is it? The one in front of you, perfect. So that's the best one to get. So now we're gonna change gears and we're gonna talk about whooping cough, um, also known as pertussis, which is not just for children anymore. Um, so whooping cough is caused by a bacteria uh, we ca it's caused by the Bordadella pertussis bacteria. So when we talk about pertussis, we mean whooping cough. And we have also seen a resurgence of whooping cough here in the United States. So in 2010, there were 27,000 cases in the U.S. And that increased up to 2012, we had 41,000 cases. So it almost doubled. 
14 infant deaths due to whooping cough. So that really is who tends to get you know, the, the most severe complications from whooping cough is really young, young infant children. What they have found when they've looked at a lot of the outbreaks uh, of whooping cough is that majority of the people who get whooping cough are actually pre-adolescents. So right at that age 10, 11, 12 year, that's when people, young people seem to be uh, most um, uh, um, Event open to getting whooping cough. Uh, and the reason, which we'll talk about in a minute, is because children get vaccinated for whooping cough when they're really, really little, when they're infants. But that booster for whooping cough isn't usually done until that, right when they're about going into middle school. So that age 10, 11, 12, we found that that immunity <coughs> tends to wane. So the classic symptoms of whooping cough is usually the first seven to 10 days People get runny nose, low-grade fever, a mild cough, which quite honestly could look like, you know, simple cold. But then um, after the, that initial week, week and a half, people start developing this cough. And this cough, um, in, in the olden days, the Chinese used to call it the 100-day cough, but it really can last six to 10 weeks, a severe cough. Classically, we think of this severe cough where people almost can't catch their breath when they're coughing, and then often will vomit after coughing, and then have this <gasps> where they have to take in a deep breath because they've been coughing so hard, so they get this inspiratory whoop. And the complications from whooping cough that we see particularly in young people, children can cough so badly that they get bleeding in the brain or behind the eyes. And then certainly it can settle in the lungs and young children can get very bad pneumonias. Obviously it can cause brain damage and death. What we know though is that once someone's been vaccinated for whooping cough, they don't always present in this classic way, you know, this classic whoop that we see. So um, that's something to be aware of. So among adults, if adults get whooping cough, they can just have a prolonged cough. And that can really be their only manifestation of whooping cough. So in the back of the doctor brain, when I see somebody who's coming in and they say, gosh, I've been coughing for weeks and weeks, I have to think, gosh, I wonder if that could be whooping cough. And in fact, they've done a couple different studies looking at adults and, and some adolescents who've had what we call chronic cough, so cough that's really lingering. And then they do tests and kind of look, gosh, is this whooping cough? And they've found, depending on the population that they've looked at, that anywhere from 13 to 30 percent of adults who've had cough for more than six days actually have evidence of whooping cough. So we do see it among adults. We do treat whooping cough with an antibiotic, but usually that antibiotic doesn't prevent all of that prolonged cough. The reason we treat with an antibiotic is actually so they just won't spread it to somebody else. But once you've got it, that cough is yours usually for six to 10 weeks. What we worry about, similar to measles, is whooping cough is very contagious. It's not quite as contagious as measles, but we find that if we were to put someone in a room with someone who has whooping cough, about 70% of people would get whooping cough. So it's pretty contagious. It spreads once again through droplets in the air. And what we worry about is that if an adult has whooping cough, or even a pre-adolescent, a young person, they can serve as a reservoir for this disease and then pass it on to really young children. And as I said before, that's where we see the complications of this disease, and that's where we see the deaths. So majority of deaths are in infants who are under two months, because two months is when we start vaccinating infants for whooping cough. And I already talked about how this immunity can wane as you get older and you haven't been vaccinated in a little bit. So in order to protect these young infants, we want to do what's called cocooning, where we basically try and vaccinate everybody that's around this newborn infant until that infant is old enough to get their own vaccine for whooping cough. So the whooping cough vaccine basically contains these proteins of whooping cough that it is not a live vaccine, so they have been killed. Um, and it's combined in a vaccine uh, with uh, diphtheria, a vaccine to prevent diphtheria, um, and a vaccine to prevent tetanus. So the adult vaccine is what we call a Tdap, so it has a tetanus booster in it, um, a full-dose tetanus booster, a booster for diphtheria, and then a booster for pertussis. 
and there's two different formulations on the market. But when you hear us talk about Tdap, what we're really talking is about is that tetanus, diphtheria, whooping cough booster. How effective is the whooping cough vaccine? Well, when we've looked at studying subjects, they followed 2,700 people who had been vaccinated. They took half of them randomly and vaccinated them with this whooping cough vaccine, and then they vaccinated the other with hepatitis A vaccine that had nothing to do with whooping cough. And they followed them for two and a half years. And then anybody who presented with a cough, they tested them to see if it was whooping cough. Found out the vaccine is not perfect. It's 92% effective. So we do see vaccine failures, which quite honestly we think is some of the reason that we're still seeing a decent amount of whooping cough circulating. Um, so it's not perfect and all the more reason that we do want to make sure we give people a booster for the for whooping cough. So the current recommendations are for adolescents at that you know, middle school visit, that 11 to 12 year old visit, we want to give them the whooping cough booster. So we want to give them this Tdap, the P for pertussis, instead of just the regular tetanus shot booster. We want to make sure they get uh, vaccinated for whooping cough. But for adults, if you haven't had that whooping cough booster, you should get it. So anyone over the age of 19 should get what we call that Tdap, that whooping cough booster. And in particular, for older adults, we definitely want to give it to older adults. We, there was a period of time where we were vaccinating older adults because we thought these are the grandparents who are going to be taking care of these young, young babies. But even for older adults who don't necessarily have contact with young children, it is still recommended to get a whooping cough booster. And then, of course, healthcare workers, so anyone who's going to work with patients should have a whooping cough booster. The other group that should be vaccinated for whooping cough is pregnant women. And that's once again because they're going to have this newborn baby that's not going to be vaccinated for whooping cough until the two-month visit. So it's now recommended to give the whooping cough booster during each pregnancy uh, in the third trimester specifically. And if women aren't vaccinated during pregnancy, they should be vaccinated immediately postpartum. And then we already talked about any um, adolescents or adults who are going to have contact with that young uh, infant if they haven't been given a booster for that pertussis, for that whooping cough, they should have it. Now sometimes people will ask, well, what's the safety of that vaccine in pregnancy? And I will say that, you know, of course, we don't routinely test vaccines in pregnant women. Um, but there was a very small study that was published where at least they looked at 48 women who had been vaccinated and they haven't seen any outcomes adverse outcomes from uh, being given the vaccine in the third trimester. And of course, now, you know, it's recommended in all pregnancies. So um, many, many women are being vaccinated. It is a vaccine. If any of you have ever had it, it does make your arm quite sore for several days, um, but otherwise is, is very safe to have done. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the pneumonia vaccine, also known as the pneumococcal vaccine. So a little bit about pneumococcus, that's a type of bacteria. It looks like this. It's a gram-positive bacteria. There are over 90 different types of pneumococcus and they circulate. They are spread by droplets also. And basically that pneumococcus bacteria settles in the respiratory tract and can cause a lot of different infections. Can cause ear infections, sinus infections, but what we really worry about is um, what we call more invasive infections than that. So we worry that this bacteria will get into the bloodstream and it can cause <coughs> bloodstream infections. And then from there can actually spread to the brain and cause meningitis. So really there, it causes many, many pneumonias and deaths annually in the United States. And we already said it's, it's transmitted by droplets, so if someone in the household has pneumococcus, they can absolutely spread it to other people in the household. In terms of who's at risk for invasive disease, and as I said, when I mean invasive disease, I mean the complications, the bloodstream infections, the meningitis. It's really children who are very, very young, less than two, and adults who are generally over the age of 65. But if you have a chronic illness, so you have asthma or um, you have heart disease or kidney disease, that also puts you at risk for uh, pneumococcus infection. 
We know that if people take antacids, they're at higher risk for pneumococcus infections, and that's because that acid that's in your stomach is there to protect you from germs. If you were to swallow germs, that acid kills them. But if you're taking an antacid, well, you don't have that acid working for you anymore. So we know that people are more likely to get infections. We know that smokers are more likely to get infections because that bacteria just can glom onto those airways a little bit more easily in smokers. And we also know that if people have had a little cold, you know, a few days before, for whatever reason, it makes that pneumococcus bacteria just more likely to get into the airway and from there go into the bloodstream. So there are two different types of uh, pneumo what we call pneumovax vaccines to prevent the pneumococcus uh, infection. Um, basically, there's a, a polysaccharide vaccine and a conjugate vaccine, and we don't need to get bogged down in all the details, but I'll kind of tell you some of the basic differences between them. And that is, remember how I said that there's over 90 different types of pneumococcal bacteria that circulates out there? Well, this vaccine protects you against 23 of them, whereas this vaccine, the Prevnar 13, protects you against 13, right? So, okay, there you go. And the vaccines themselves are built a little bit differently, um, which we'll talk about. So the 23 vaccine, which I said protects you against 23 different types of pneumococcus, it turns out, even though it protects you against 23 different types, and there's over 90 out there, it really protects you against about 85 to 90% of the types that really cause that invasive disease. The downside with this type of vaccine is that um, the way the vaccine is made um, and the way it's given, when it present, pre uh, presents these little um, antigens to your body, these proteins to your body, your body makes antibodies to it, but those antibodies just don't hang around quite as long. We think those antibodies last maybe five years, maybe a little bit longer. So even though it protects you against a lot of types of, of pneumococcus, that immune response that it makes just doesn't tend to be quite as long-lived. The other thing is we call it the pneumonia vaccine, but ironically it really doesn't prevent pneumonias. Um, what it really prevents is those invasive infections, those bloodstream infections, the meningitis. Um, and we know this because when they looked at uh, 47,000 people who had been given this vaccine and then they looked back at, you know, who got, who got infections, what they found was that it, it decreased those invasive infections by about half but had no effect on pneumonias. So, you know, when I give it to patients and I say, well, it's a pneumonia vaccine, I don't want patients to come back and say, see, I got pneumonia, it didn't work. I say, well, actually, even though we call it the pneumonia vaccine, it really is to prevent some of those complications of pneumonias. So who should get this 23 vaccine? Um, anyone who's over the age of 65 should be vaccinated. And then people who are at risk for these pneumococcal infections, which we already talked about. So those are people who have other diseases like heart disease or other lung diseases like asthma or liver disease or people who are diabetic or people who smoke. Um, so those are the people that really should get that, that 23 pneumovax vaccine. And then people maybe who live in an environment where they might be more likely to just get infections. So someone who's in a nursing home, for example, or you know, the, where, where people might be a little bit more crowded and, and sharing facilities. Okay, so moving on to that 13 type vaccine, what's the advantage of that and why do we have two different types? Well, the way this vaccine works is we've taken this pneumococcus bacteria and we attach it to like a carrier protein so that when we inject it into the body, it's, it presents it to your immune system in a different way. And the advantage of that is that it makes antibodies in your body that last a whole lot longer. So not only does it make these antibodies more robust, it makes more antibodies, but we also know that those antibodies just hang out and last longer. And that's been shown in a couple different studies. What's also been shown in studies is we've looked at what if we give this 23 vaccine first and then the 13 vaccine? Does that, does that make a difference? Or what if we give the 13 vaccine first and then the 23? And what we found is that it is better to give the 13 vaccine first if we can, because then your body makes this better immune response and then we follow it up with the 23 vaccine. We know that if we give the 23 vaccine first, 
you know, your body will still react to that 13 vaccine, but just not quite as well. So for this 13 vaccine, who should get it? Guess what? People over the age of 65, just like the other one. And this is a new guideline that was just released this fall. But um, younger people can get it as long as they are immunocompromised in some way. So really this um, 13 vaccine, we definitely want to give it to older adults but it is recommended for younger people if they have a, um, a condition that makes them immunocompromised. So they've had a bone marrow transplant or uh, chemotherapy, for example. I will also say that this 13 vaccine is being given currently to young children. So it is part of the vaccine that young kids are now getting. Um, so we're still giving a booster, obviously, now for adults. Because uh, like I said, those antibodies, they hang out for a good long time, but we still find that adults may need a booster. So people who are immunocompromised should get this vaccine. So that includes people who have HIV, who have a malignancy, who've had a transplant. Um, people maybe who don't have a spleen or don't have a functioning spleen because the spleen is what helps protect you also from uh, illnesses. Um, people who have problems with that CSF, the fluid that surrounds the brain um, where maybe it's leaking in some way and putting people at risk for infections. And people who have cochlear implants who are also at risk for more invasive infections. So this 13 vaccine has been studied in terms of what's the data, how well does it, does it work. Um, there's a big trial at, that um, just finished where they looked at 85,000 people in the Netherlands who are over the age of 65. And they divided them in half and randomized them in a way where they got half of them got this 13 vaccine and half of them got a sham vaccine that didn't protect them against anything. Um, and what they found was that this vaccine actually does protect against pneumonias, unlike the 23 vaccine. So people got, about 46% had fewer uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. 75% had fewer uh, invasive pneumococcal disease. So this vaccine really seems to work quite well. And I bet if you have me come back in two or three years, there's a lot of talk now about the thought that maybe this will be the vaccine that will eventually replace the 23 vaccine. Right now, both are recommended in older adults, but a lot of people are thinking this vaccine really seems to perform a little bit better and ultimately may be the one that's recommended. So just let's do a final breakdown of the two. We talked about the 23 vaccine protecting against 23 different types. It has 12 types that are in common with the 13 vaccine. We said it, pre it prevents invasive disease, but not pneumonia. The antibodies it makes don't last quite as long. Um, whereas this one, 13 different types, protects against pneumonia and invasive disease, better immune response. If we have a choice, we want to give this one first. Um, and I will say that uh, even though we talk about the 13 vaccine being the one that works a little bit better, we do know that, remember, there's still types here that aren't covered by the 13 vaccine. And these, these other vaccine types cause about 38% of invasive disease, which is why both right now are recommended for older adults. So we talked about the rules for this vaccine. Um, if this 13 vaccine is indicated, we try and give it first. Uh, because we want to give both vaccines, ideally we want to space them out to give your body a chance to make a good immune response. So ideally we space them by a year, at a minimum eight weeks, but at least a year. Right now we only give that 13 vaccine once in adults because it seems to make a pretty good immune response. But the 23 vaccine, those antibodies don't hang around quite so long, and we do need to give boosters. And so the 23 vaccine will usually give a booster every five years, up to three total. And ideally, one of those boosters is after the age of 65. All right, so now I'm going to move on. I'll let you guys be the doctor here. So, <laughs> hey, there you go. Someone already named it. Perfect. 53-year-old man presents complaining of a burning sensation over his left chest. Initially, when he's seen, nothing abnormal is seen on examination of the skin. But three days later, a rash appears. And what's the diagnosis? Shingles. shingles, exactly. Also known as zoster, but we call it shingles. This is the classic uh, shingles or zoster rash right here. It can be um, as, as 
we doctors say, you know, it really, people come in and say, gosh, I'm having this terrible pain, and you lift up the shirt, and there's nothing there, usually in the beginning part of the illness. So a lot of times people end up getting x-rays and CT scans and all sorts of things because doctors are trying to figure out what is this horrible pain that someone's having and then three or four days later is when the rash usually comes and then you say oh, of course it's it's shingles. Um, so a little bit about shingles. Uh, shingles is caused by the chicken pox virus and so I'm sure most of you probably had chicken pox when you were young so when you get that chicken pox infection when you're young that virus actually goes dormant and settles in the sensory nerves in your body and usually doesn't cause any trouble until either you get much older or maybe you get sick with something else and your immune system for whatever reason just doesn't function quite as well and as that immune system doesn't function quite as well that shingles virus revs back up and reactivates and when it reactivates it causes that rash and usually quite a bit of pain. So shingles or zoster um, will happen to about 30% of people over their lifetime. And you know, the, it's certainly uncomfortable and you know, can present with a rash, but what we really worry about with shingles is that in some people, they get pain that persists much, much longer than the rash itself. And that's what we call post-herpetic neuralgia. So that's really pain that persists longer than 120 days. And for some people, it can persist a lifetime. Some people, maybe it's several months and then it goes away. But it really can be quite debilitating because people will complain of kind of a burning uh, pain that really lingers. And we know that as people get older, they're more likely to get that post-herpetic neuralgia. And it can be seen in anywhere from uh, 13 to 40 percent of people who get the shingles. So the shingles vaccine, we call it the zoster vaccine. It is different than the chickenpox vaccine, although it's the same virus. Um, but the chickenpox vaccine, I should say the shingles vaccine, um, has more. It's a stronger vaccine than the chickenpox vaccine. So even though it's the same virus, it is, it is stronger. And the reason we want it to be stronger is that we give it to older adults to really kind of boost their immunity so that the body says, oh, I'm being exposed again to this chickenpox vaccine. Gosh, I better rev up my antibodies. And the hope with that is that if it revs up your own immune system, then it doesn't allow that chickenpox vaccine that has settled in your body to reactivate. It is a live vaccine. Uh, we already talked about that, meaning that if it were given to somebody who's immunocompromised, it could cause the chickenpox. So that is something to know about this vaccine. How well does the vaccine work? Well, it's been studied in about 38,000 adults. They randomized them to either this shingles vaccine versus placebo, a sham vaccine. And their primary endpoint was what they called burden of illness. So that meant not only how many people got shingles, but they also looked at how bad was the pain and how long did it last. And then they also looked at how many people got this post-herpetic neuralgia, this pain that lasted longer than 120 days. And they followed them for three years and found that the vaccine reduced the incidence of shingles by about 50% and reduced the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia by about two-thirds. And overall reduced the burden of illness, meaning how severe it was, by about 60%. We also know that if the vaccine is given on the younger side, meaning 50s, 60s, it works better than if it's given to somebody who's 80 years old. And I think that's just largely because your immune system when you're 50 and 60 works a little better than your immune system when you're 80. So um, this vaccine has also been studied in adults over the age of 50, works just as well. Um, so this is one of those vaccines where I talked about that is FDA approved over the age of 50. But the ACIP, remember that group that makes recommendations to the CDC, recommends it for adults over the age of 60. And the reason is because they were worried about vaccine shortages. So it is, you know, it is FDA approved for adults over the age of 50, and I tell people if your insurance company will pay for it, get it when you're 50, because you know, your immune system is better and you'll make a better immune response. But right now it's recommended for 60 or older. And you don't have to worry whether you're immune to chicken pox or not, because you're gonna get this vaccine and then you will be immune to chicken pox if you've never had the chicken pox. Um, remember that all young people now are 
young, meaning kids, are being vaccinated for chickenpox. So we're not going to see as much regular chickenpox circulating because even young kids now are being vaccinated for it. Contraindications to this vaccine, remember we said it's a live vaccine, so we don't want to give it to anyone who'd be pregnant. We don't want to give it to anyone who's immunocompromised or who's ill with something else. Um, so those are really the big contraindications to getting that vaccine. The other thing I'll just say about this vaccine is um, it's a little bit of a tricky vaccine. It has to be frozen when it's transported, and then it, you have to unfreeze it, and you have to give it right away, otherwise it spoils. And so it's just, it's very, it's a hard vaccine to store in the doctor's office. And I will say, actually, in, um, in my clinic, we don't carry it for that reason. So I write people a prescription, and they take it to Walgreens and get it done. And it's not a cheap vaccine either. It costs about $150. So that's just something to know. Um, Medicare is covering it, but not everybody has the drug benefits. So sometimes the out-of-pocket cost for this vaccine can actually be, um, be a lot. But we think that if we vaccinate 17 people, we'll prevent one case of shingles. And if we vaccinate 31 people, we'll prevent one case of post-herpetic neuralgia. Um, just a few remaining questions. I said, well, what's going to happen now that we're vaccinating all of the children for chickenpox? We're not going to have that usual chickenpox virus circulating. And, you know, we've relied on that chickenpox virus to circulate. So if I'm exposed to chickenpox, and I had chickenpox when I'm young, that kind of boosts my own immune system, which then helps me in the long run not develop shingles, quite honestly, so that my own body doesn't reactivate shingles. But if now we don't have that wild-type chickenpox circulating, our own immune systems might not get boosted. And we do worry that we'll start seeing more shingles actually at a younger age. The good news is if we vaccinated all these young people for chickenpox, hopefully they'll never get shingles because they won't have that virus in their body. Vaccines for teens and young adults. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the human papilloma virus. It's also called the genital wart virus or the cervical cancer virus. Um, it is a type of virus that can cause both genital warts and it's also linked to cervical cancer and anal cancer. It is a sexually transmitted infection uh, because that virus is transmitted sexually. There are over 200 types of this virus that circulate out in, you know, in the community. And if we were to take all comers and just test them, you know, about half of people have at least one type of this virus in their body. Um, so a lot of people are exposed to it and never have any problems from it whatsoever. But there are a few types of this human papillomavirus that tend to just cause more infections, and we'll talk about those in a minute. We know that about 40 million people are currently infected with HPV, the human papillomavirus, and there are about 6 million new cases each year. Most of those cases, like I said, your body, your own immune system takes care of, and they don't cause any trouble. But sometimes uh, that infection is not cleared by the body and then can cause warts, and what we worry about more is causing cancer, cervical cancer, anal cancer. And we know that the, a woman's lifetime cervical cancer risk is about 3.6% which is why we do pap smears. We do pap smears to screen for, and for cervical cancer and hopefully catch it very early when it can be treated. So the, um, we have now, I can say, three different vaccines for the human papilloma virus that is recommended for young people. Um, the first vaccine is a quadrivalent vaccine, meaning it, it protects you against four types. Remember, I said there's over 200 types of human papillomavirus. But quite honestly, there's only probably, we think, maybe about 15 bad actors in this human papillomavirus that really are causing most of the cancers. So this quadrivalent vaccine, which is called Gardasil, um, actually has four different HPV types in it. Um, type 6 and 11, which cause a majority of um, genital warts and type 16 and 18. And it's estimated that type 16 and 18 account for about 70% of all cervical cancers. So we really think now that cervical cancer is really caused by the wart virus. 
There's also another vaccine called Severix, which doesn't have the ones that cause genital warts, but really just uh, protects against type 16 and 18 that cause cervical cancer. And then just approved in December is called Gardasil 9, which protects against nine types. Right now, FDA approved, but not recommended yet by ACIP because it hasn't really been looked at, but, um, but I think will be uh, recommended shortly. And this Gardasil 9 has nine different types estimated to protect, give a little more protection against um, more of the strains that tend to cause cancers. We do know that all of these vaccines, they work very well. If we can vaccinate someone before they've been exposed to HPV, it'll prevent about 97% of those specific HPV infections. So the key here is we want to vaccinate people really early before they've been exposed to any of these viruses. So that's the reason it's recommended for as young as nine years old because so many young people are starting to um, get exposure to these viruses when they have sex, and obviously many young people are having sex when they're in middle school, high school, and so they're getting exposed to these viruses. So it's now recommended to give to young people, ideally at that 11 to 12 year old office visit, but it is approved for young people as young as nine. Um, the, um, the uh, HPV vaccine is given as a three-dose vaccine, so you know, you give it once, and then you give it in a month, and then you repeat it in six months. Let's say somebody never got the vaccine. You know, they're 17, maybe they're past that 11 to 12-year-old visit. Even if they've had a history of genital warts, they should still get the vaccine because you don't know which HPV type they were exposed to. So just because someone has had a history of HPV, they should still get the HPV vaccine. Um, we do know this vaccine stings a lot when it's given. It can cause um, some local reactions, and there were actually several cases of young people fainting after they got the vaccine, and it's hard to know whether that vaccine truly caused fainting or whether they were just young and scared and, and fainted. Um, but anyway, that, that is one thing to know when you get the vaccine. They usually want to watch you for 10 or 15 minutes afterwards uh, so that you don't faint. Um, and I have actually seen a couple people who've been allergic to some components of the vaccine. Um, so if someone has hypersensitivity to yeast, they can react to this vaccine. So that's just something to know. It's also recommended in boys. And it's recommended in boys for two reasons. One is that uh, boys often are the carriers of this virus, uh, which then is passed to girls, which then causes cervical cancer. So we're really vaccinating many boys to prevent cervical cancer. So it is recommended for boys, same thing, at the 11 to 12 year old visit. Um, recommended up to age 21 for boys. Men who have sex with men, it is absolutely recommended, and that's really to prevent anal cancer. And so um, men who have sex with men, it's recommended that they be vaccinated, um, and young men can be vaccinated up to age 26. And it, I would say right now you could vaccinate either with that um, Gardasil vaccine that protects you against four types or the new HPV-9 um, that protects you against uh, nine types, which right now for boys is only approved ages nine to 15. So what we don't know is are we gonna find new vaccines? Are we eventually gonna have the HPV-30 uh, vaccine? It's certainly possible. Um, the other thing that we don't know is we don't know how long these antibodies last when we give the vaccine. Uh, right now it's recommended to give this three dose series and then we're done and we don't, uh, we don't give boosters. But I think that's one of the things that's being studied now is really looking at how long these antibodies last. Okay, now our final infection of the night that we're gonna talk about for young people um, is meningococcus, which is a type of bacteria that is spread. The actual name of the bacteria is Neisseria meningitidis. It's a type of bacteria called a gram-negative bacteria. And it causes a meningococcal infection, so an infection from this bacteria. Um, it's a very rare infection. But what we worry about is, even though it's incredibly rare, if someone is infected with meningococcus, it can cause a very serious infection. 
So we know that about 10% of adults actually carry this bacteria in their noses and it causes them no trouble whatsoever. Their body's used to it, it doesn't cause an invasive infection, you've kind of made your own immune response to it, it doesn't cause you any trouble. But because some people carry it around, they could spread it to someone else for whatever reason who happens to get an in, a more invasive infection. And like I said, that's incredibly rare, but we do see it. So if someone were to get men, a meningococcal infection that's invasive, what happens is they can get bloodstream infections, and then that bloodstream infection spreads to the lining around the brain and causes meningitis. And um, when young people get meningitis, it is uh, incredibly fatal. So about 10% will die, uh, but an even larger amount will be permanently disabled with you know, brain damage, hearing loss, uh, people can get such severe infections that they lose limbs. So um, it really can be a very serious disease, although it is very rare. There are 13 um, different uh, types of meningococcus that kind of circulate, but we really primarily see infections from just a few different types of groups. And, um, and each of these groups that we kind of see, A, B, C, and Y, you know, they, um, A is rare in the United States, but these groups account for about 30% each of the infections that circulate. So the vaccines that we have cover four of these types. So once again, they don't cover all the types, but they cover most of the types that we see circulating here in the US. Um, I won't go into big detail with the two types of vaccines, but it's kind of similar to when we were talking about the pneumonia vaccines in that there's really two different types of vaccines. There's a polysaccharide vaccine and a conjugate vaccine, and they work on the immune system in a little bit different way. <coughs> But the way it boils down is this. Um, the polysaccharide vaccine makes antibodies that don't last quite as long. And so we tend not to really use it very much. It's really mostly used for people who are gonna travel and you're traveling abroad and that place that you're traveling says, you need a vaccine for meningococcus. Well, that's the vaccine to have. But the vaccine for young people is the conjugate vaccine. That's the one that we give that really, those antibodies last a good long time. So that's the one we're giving to all of our young people. And it's now, um, some of these vaccines are approved really from ages two to 55. So I'm sure a lot of you heard last year there were a couple different meningitis outbreaks. Um, uh, one in Santa Barbara, um, one in Princeton um, among college students. And the outbreaks that they saw were actually meningococcal group B. And if you remember, the, group, the vaccines I was talking about actually don't contain um, group B in them. And so they had kids who were getting these uh, meningitis and infections, but the vaccine we were giving doesn't protect them against this particular type. Um, so there was actually a vaccine that's been approved in um, Europe and Canada and was just now approved here in the United States that they used um, on a, what we call a compassionate use basis, so on an experimental basis, and given to these young people to prevent this type of infection in 2014. So we now have two new meningococcal vaccines that have just been approved, one in October and another in um, uh, just a couple weeks ago. Those both protect against this meningococcal type B. Both have not been recommended yet by that ACIP organization, but I think we'll see more information about that soon. Uh, but these are vaccines that will be given to young people because that's really who gets these invasive infections is really young people who are going off to college where they're living in group livings and you know sharing utensils and all of that and um, seem to be more exposed. So in terms of who should be vaccinated, as we said, for young people, we want to give them that conjugate vaccine, that one that lasts and has antibodies that are long lasting. And ideally we'll give it, um, ideally at the 12 year old visit, but the point is we want to give it to young people, ideally before they go to high school and college, before they're being exposed. Um, if they didn't get it at that uh, 11 to 12 year old visit, we could give them the vaccine instead when they're coming into high school or even at college entry. Uh, we also wanna give it to military recruits, people who are gonna live together in barracks, for example. Um, there was a recent outbreak in New York City among men who had sex with men um, who were meeting in bars who uh, um, were transmitting meningococcus. And so there were some recommendations about if you're traveling to New York, 
and you're a man who's going to have sex with another man and meet in a bar, you should be vaccinated for meningococcus. Um, and so it's recommended based on that. And then we usually do give a booster to young people five years after they've been vaccinated. If they're still in those living situations like dorms and you know, colleges or high school. So basically, um, as I said, young people get vaccinated, they get one dose. If they're still in those living conditions like college, um, then they should be given a booster five years later. There are some other recommendations for this vaccine for people who are immunocompromised. I won't go through all of those details, but I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. So take home points for today. We, um, we talked about the uh, whooping cough boosters uh, for anyone who hasn't had their booster yet. We talked about the pneumonia um, vaccine, particularly the 13 vaccine. Um, for people who are immunocompromised and everybody over the age of 65. We talked about the shingles vaccine over the age of 60, but licensed for those who are 50. We talked about everybody getting the flu shot. Um, and we talked about measles and how, particularly if you're going to travel internationally, you want to be immune to measles, but you want to make sure you've had your two doses. And then finally, I'll direct you back to the CDC website. And so with that, uh, thank you so much for having me, and I'm happy to take questions. So it's, it's a great question. So the question is about all the different statistics. And, um, and I think, uh, so the first point is, you know, your chance of getting shingles, we said, was about 30%, just in general, if you've been exposed to um, chicken pox. And then we were saying, we think in this study, this vaccine was, depending on what age it's given, because uh, we know it seems to be a little bit more effective if we give it at a younger age, might be anywhere between 50 to 60% effective in terms of preventing shingles. So it doesn't prevent all cases. And then the question was, how do we get to the number of, if I vaccinate 17 people, I prevent one case of shingles? I think some of that is, you know, this is based on looking at a couple different studies. So the 60% effectiveness study was based on that study, which was how it was FDA approved where they looked at you know, the thousands of people that they looked at. They um, studied you know, how many they got the vaccine, how many got shingles, and we know it prevented about 60% of the cases. The, the statistic about one out of 17 is actually looking at kind of all of the different studies and looking at cost effectiveness, like how cost effective is that um, medication um, on that kind of population level. Um, and so you're right, the numbers don't quite add up, but you have to remember when they do studies where they give the vaccine and they study those people, um, that's really under perfect conditions, right? Because you know they've selected those people, they, um, they know that uh, they're getting the vaccine, they follow them for three years in that study, they actually called them by phone every month, do you have a rash, do you have a rash, do you have a rash? If they have a rash, come on in, I want to look at it. They studied it, tested it, made sure it was shingles. Whereas like the one out of 17 is really looking at all comers and that's based on many, much, much data that's out there and probably um, more on how it may really perform, for example. So it's a good question, and you know, it's hard to say exactly how well it performs. Um, but I think the thought is that um, you know, it, we know that it doesn't prevent all cases of shingles, but we know that it certainly prevents a good number. And what we really worry about is that it, we want it to really prevent that post-herpetic neuralgia, some of those complications, and also just quite honestly the burden of illness like we talked about in that study. You know, how severe is that? How much pain do people get? But it's a, it's a smart question, smart question to ask, yeah. So the question is, if you've had a bone marrow transplant, do you need to get all of your, maybe the immunizations that you had before, but like boosters all over again? So I would say it depends. Um, there are a lot of uh, guidelines for people who are immunocompromised from bone marrow transplants about what they should get. Um, and there are actually um, some other vaccines that I didn't even talk about tonight that are recommended for people who have bone marrow transplants. Um, yeah, so where can a person go to find all of that? So on the CDC website, you know, when I, when I presented that first chart where it kind of had all the different indications for vaccines, it does have vaccines for special populations, so people who are immunocompromised, and you can kind of look. I would say the one thing that bone marrow transplant patients shouldn't get unless, in, unless you're having a consultation with their um, specific cancer doctor. In general, we don't give those live vaccines to people who've had bone marrow transplants. I think that's really the biggest thing that you just want to keep in the back of your mind. Thank you. 
Yeah. Why don't I take a stri the striped shirt? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you get shingles more than once? Can you get shingles more than once? Unfortunately, yes, you can. So usually, um, usually once you've had shingles, it does boost your own immune system so that you shouldn't get it again. But when they've done studies um, where they followed a population of people for 20, 30 years in a community, they found about one out of 100 people does get shingles twice. So it does happen. Yeah, so the question was pregnant women and, and measles, because the measles vaccine is a live vaccine, we don't want to give it when women are pregnant. Um, we can test to see if they're immune. Uh, so ideally, and, and actually um, the uh, obstetricians are really good about that. So when women are first pregnant, they do draw, ironically, they draw immunity to rubella, the German measles, which is also part of that that MMR vaccine. So they will check when women first get pregnant to see if they're immune. Um, if women are not immune, they'll vaccinate them immediately uh, postpartum. Um, I should also say that there are some guidelines just with this recent measles outbreak that if you know, if a pregnant woman were exposed to measles, um, you know, there would probably be a discussion as to whether it's whether or not to give that live vaccine or not. And um, but I, but if we were talking about just a, a woman who hasn't been exposed, who's pregnant, ideally, we try not to give that live vaccine. Um, I think that an that answered. I think is it only live vaccine, or is there another? There is not another, so it is only oh, a live vaccine. It's an yeah, yeah. And Oh, so the question is, and what about that whooping cough um, vaccine recommended for women? It is recommended ideally in the third trimester. What if a woman got it in her first trimester? They wouldn't then give it again in the third trimester. But ideally, the reason it's um, that they want it given in the third trimester is they want those um, when a, when a woman is pregnant, she passes some antibodies on to that fetus and to the baby when that baby is initially born. And so ideally, they want the, that vaccine timed in the third trimester so the mother passes on those antibodies to the baby. So the baby has those antibodies for the first six to eight weeks until the baby can be vaccinated on their own. And so that's the reason why it's timed that way. It's a good question. Um, yeah. So the question was, how is it before 1957 that you can, is it really true you can be immune to measles? And actually, um, people, it's found because we talked about how, um, uh, how infectious measles is, that it, you know, really just spreads so easily, that there was just so much measles circulating that really they find that everybody born before that time you know, was infected. Now, even though people come in and say, my mom swears I didn't have that measles rash, I've never had measles, there are some people actually who don't get a rash with measles. So they've just found that even though people say, you know, I didn't have that infection, no one remembers me having that infection, that they, you know, there was just so much measles circulating that they really are immune and probably, and did have it. Uh, you know, it's a good question about the mumps. I think mumps is not quite as infectious as measles, but, you know, the vaccine, of course, covers all of them. So it is presumed in 57, before, you know, before that age, that if you had measles, you probably had mumps also at that age. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was with that shingles and it's gone dormant in your body, what makes it reactivate and, um, and you know, go live in your body. Um, you know, and normally your own immune system kind of keeps it at bay. And we don't quite understand this because for some people we know that immune system just doesn't quite function as well as you get older and so it comes up. Sometimes if people are under a lot of stress, we'll see it all. I've seen shingles even in young people who just are under a tremendous amount of stress or maybe they get sick with something else and so your body is busy fighting this other infection and you know, then the shingles um, infection pops up. Thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to stay, and you're welcome to come up here, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.